Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, today's panel, the Digital Sprint to 2030. Uh, today's topic is going to be focused around digital technologies and the positive impact it can have on the sustainable development goals, especially with the backdrop of the pandemic. As we look towards the next 10 years to 2030, uh, the tech sector alone can generate an additional revenue of $2 trillion or more um, globally on an annual basis. So on this panel, we'll outline the UN's uh, roadmap for the goals for the SDGs, um, what kind of stakeholder collaboration can happen and what kind of sector group collaboration um, could lead to unlocking some of this opportunity. So I wanna start off by introducing our panelists. Uh, Peter Lacey is the Senior uh, Managing Director at Accenture. Rebecca Mazizak is the CEO of TechSoup Global. And in a little bit, uh, Mr. Fabrizio Hochschild, the Special Advisor to the Secretary, Secretary General of the UN will join us uh, for this session. Um, but first I wanted to start off with you, Peter. Um, when we look at what's going on in the tech sector specifically, we're seeing a lot of collaboration that's happening that we haven't seen before. It's a multi-stakeholder collaboration. How do you um, see the industry um, continuing this collaboration now and post pandemic um, as we look towards 2030? Well, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Thank you to WEF, I think. And it's a great topic to be having um, at the heart of the debate on how it is that we accelerate the business contribution to the sustainable development goals. I think my two key messages on this topic are that, um, that on the one hand, there is the enormous opportunity that you mentioned. We are seeing an incredible um, convergence of technologies in combina and combinatorial impacts uh, that are al allowing us to think very, very differently about how we can uh, really use digital to enable sustainability. Uh, it could be physical technologies uh, linked to digital. It could be biological technologies linked to digital. But often we see digital as this backbone with big data and analytics and intelligence with advances in technologies like cloud computing uh, in ways of thinking about how we measure and manage and communicate and add value through intelligence uh, that helps us to be more precise, more targeted, more applied uh, in tackling so many different sustainability issues. Uh, I mean, it can range from how we think about um, the, the data and the analytics and the uh, intelligence that helps us to think differently about distributed energy systems or rethinking what it takes to run solar parks, wind farms, what it takes to rethink the built environment with connected devices. So there's huge potential and that potential is often in combination. Now, so that leads me to my second point, which is that that requires multi-stakeholder collaboration on a scale that we've rarely seen uh, either on sustainability or on technology. So on technology, you'll often see ecosystems of software partners working with integrators, working with clients, but normally you're talking two or three different players working together. In sustainability, you may see cross-sector collaboration, um, but what we believe is that we need another level of collaboration that allows us to look end-to-end -end in supply chains, for example, or end-to-end -end rethinking entire energy systems. Uh, and that, I think, is, is why it's so good to see that as part of the conversation at the United Nations. Today, for example, we launched with SAP um, and with 3M, a new program called the SDG Ambition that looks to integrate sustainabilities into things like enterprise management solutions, helping to produce the softwares that allow us to much more accurately measure performance, to be able to communicate that, to be able to assess um, value. So I think those are my two starting messages on this and really around the fact, yes, huge opportunity, often in combination, but requires uh, a huge amount of, our, of all of us raising our game on collaboration to deliver the value and the real impact on sustainability. In that point, uh, Rebecca, I want to bring you in. Rebecca, you, you run uh, TechSoup Global, which is a nonprofit that provides technology solutions to other nonprofits. Um, on that topic of multi stakeholder collaboration, what, what's the best way to foster the, the public private sector collaboration? 
Well, the, thank you. The sustainable development goals uh, can really only be achieved with the inclusion and guidance of a strong civil society. And that's the, the area that we work in. So I'm going to emphasize my remarks there. Uh, we achieve these goals one person at a time, so they have to be quite inclusive. Uh, a little bit about our, our kind of perspective, we, we um, reach 1.3 million nonprofits through TechSoup, and this is really one of the biggest uh, civil society networks in the world. Um, our role is really to build capacity across all the road priorities and all the 17 global goals. And we're a global alliance of more than 60 NGOs who work together with more than 100 technology companies. Uh, and we scale these activities through technology. This marketplace that we have, just to give you a sense, has facilitated more than $14 billion worth of technology resources and funding in 200 countries. And last year alone, uh, a, million and a, half, a billion and a half, rather. Um, and civil society itself is made up of 12 million uh, organizations and, and lots of groups and, and others who are activists um, that contribute about $4 trillion to the global economy. So it's very large and very diverse, uh, has a workforce of about 250 million. And um, they bring an understanding of the impact of economic and social injustice. And they often act as a bellwether of issues that are really still invisible to the rest of society, like human rights violations or ocean plastics. Uh, with, with that context in mind, I'll comment on two of the recommendations of the UN Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. The first is the concept of digital inclusion. The 2030 goal, ensure, goal ensuring that every person has you know, safe and affordable access to the internet will require the highest levels of global cooperation and civil society must be included in, in this most important goal, which so many other goals rely on. Um, and to this end, we were pleased the, to chair with the World Economic Forum Industry Group uh, uh, set up uh, the civil society action over the summer to begin to create a roadmap to closing digital divides. Uh, we also think about inclusion as a first principle across all stages of technology for social outcomes. It really has the potential to <clears throat> mitigate the injustice and negative consequences of innovations. Uh, civil society has significant experience with inclusive methodologies. Um, we need to build on that and engage those practices in civil society and technology design, development, and use uh, across all the SDGs. And we see that technology developed with the community involved uh, in all stages really will increase the likelihood of relevant, trusted, and timely uh, resources to reach constituents uh, better. Um, I can share a few quick examples there. Um, this is some things that grassroots uh, organizations have built for grassroots communities, mobile apps. Um, one is Ask, Ask Izzy, which is really getting resources to people experiencing homelessness in Australia. Uh, other countries are also exploring the use of it. The Safe Shelter Collaborative, which is supporting organizations in finding shelter for survivors of human trafficking, domestic violence, sexual assault, finding it in minutes instead of days. And Worker Connect, which is giving migrant workers in the Persian Gulf a, a worker voice tool and soon is uh, going to be used for healthcare workers in Eastern Europe. So these are all grassroots teams who built these products and they did include the community at all stages of development. The other major area of the roadmap that I wanted to comment on is uh, digital public goods. A marketplace for digital public goods uh, is recommended and can certainly allow uh, us to build a network effect on the informal networks of civil society that they already use a lot and, and to share resources and practices. Um, a community of purpose and practice around the digital public goods and common data sets is required uh, to link to impact community dialogue and innovation. Common data sets enable data-driven decisions and the kind of data aggreg aggregation that can really support advocacy. Um, they also ensure that the people too often left out are included in the discussions on progress toward or away from the goals. Uh, projects that help provide visibility into things like hand washing stations or government resources, or transportation in, in previously unmapped areas are all good examples of other potential public uh, digital public goods. These projects demonstrate how shared methodologies, tools, and data provide key information to both community members and also can improve decision-making at the community and national level. Um, and also it's just critical that we have support for these public goods um, and that the technology is agnostic, uh, that we think about uh, the fit for purpose and making it sustainable and that we have you know, customer success uh, as part of, uh, like we think about it on the commercial side, we need to think about that for these groups as well.
Yeah. Uh, in, in closing, um, I, I just want to say there's no one answer because of the diversity of how to best do these cooperations, but we have to include uh, commitment to this, you know, access and inclusion, but also training and security and uh, other kind of uh, protections around governance. And it's it's really up to us who are privileged to be in these big conversations to find ways to use digital technologies to connect grassroots civil society as contributors and as a sector stakeholder in global cooperation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and th those are such great examples. I, I just um, heard that the um, Mr. Undersecretary has joined us, so um, I'm hoping that he can actually give us the roadmap for the UN. Um, Mr. Undersecretary, are you, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. I'm so sorry. I apologize for, for coming a bit late, but we, it's, it's a platform that one reaches through many roundabout ways, but I'm, I'm very glad to be here. So yes, the roadmap. Look, um, the roadmap that digital technology is the fastest spreading technologies ever. Uh, in past technologies to simplify what is tremendously complex, you have the business community that boosts development, profit, outreach, and then you have governments that pay attention to the public good, that pay attention to technologies not um, undermining uh, uh, the broader public good. So in the late 19th century, the meat industry expanded massively in New York. Uh, there was very little regulation. Uh, then half the army got poisoned through a major provider in New York. The, 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 the meat regulation, food regulation began. And that's the way the, the interplay, as I say, vast simplification tends to work between those who defend the public good and those who advance very legitimate and praiseworthy business interests. Digital is special because it's spread at a speed that has left policymakers and those responsible for the public good way behind. And we've created something that we don't even understand fully the impact. Nobody anticipated in creating technologies that, were, would, that, that, that had all the promise to bring us much closer that they would leave us more polarized. Nobody anticipated when we created technologies that allowed many to have a voice that they hadn't had before that it would undermine our democracy. So there are all sorts of unintended side effects and malicious uses. National countries are trying to catch up. Many regions, especially Europe, are trying to catch up. But at a global level, and these are technologies that do not recognize borders, we're still struggling to catch up. But by definition, the global steerage is absolutely critical. And we're seeing the results of inadequate global steerage. We're seeing tech fragmentation. We're seeing the politicization of the tech world. We're seeing the utilization of tech to lead surrogate wars in ways that is damaging for tech, damaging for the world, and certainly undermines the possibilities of achieving universal connectivity without which we won't get the SDGs. And that's the background to the roadmap. That's why we need a roadmap to enhance international digital cooperation. And startups and business have a key role in this. Whether we like it or not, what we had with the nuclear era, what we had with electricity, what we had with railways, what we had with every other major technological advance, that it happened very much under the auspices of government, is not happening with tech. Tech is way ahead of government. And by default, a lot of functions that traditionally were with government are now with tech. Deciding on my privacy rights is much more with tech companies that I use than with any government. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that we, won't, we won't manage this. We won't manage to steer digital cooperation for good, to steer digital technologies for good, unless there's full buy-in um, as much from governments as um, from, from tech companies. In terms of the big actors, that means they can do more to ensure that the focus switches to affordable connectivity. With the increased digitalization of the world, digital is no longer a luxury. Those who don't have digital are pushed further back, especially with COVID now. That the lack of digitalization doesn't mean a loss of action. It means no access to education. It means no access to health. It means no access to work in many cases. So it's a bit like when everybody had horses, if you had a car, it was a luxury. But when 60% of the world has cars and you belong to the 40% who have horses, you're left much further behind. You're disadvantaged massively. And that's the point where we are today with digital technology. 
So I think all big companies have to ask themselves, what are we doing to achieve not just our profit gains, but to achieve universal affordable access? Because in the absence of focus on that, they're contributing, even if unwittingly, to the digital divide. And these billion, trillion dollar companies can't afford the luxury of naivety that they could afford when they were garage uh, operations. Um, so what economic uh, opportunities are we creating? What are we doing um, for affordability? Are our efforts to scale? I think those are key questions. And for startups, I think one has to see, you know, how are we contributing to the sustainable development goals? Are we, you know, is this yet another app to give me, I live in Williamsburg, New York, yet better access to bubble tea? Or is this really going to help employment? Is this really going to do something for the most disadvantaged? How is it going to help this um, um, uh, uh, inequality? And we can't, I think, until now, there's been a slight sort of laissez-faire approach. There's been a sort of almost 19th century idea as you liberate digital technologies and there'll be a trickle-down effect and, and it will just work on its own. I think by now we've learned that's not the case. Unguided that the damage will be at least equal to the benefits. Um, so we need to make a much more conscious effort, our side as policymakers and the business um, as, as well. And just to give you one illustration, the paradox of this, you know, we think 21st te century technologies, it's at the forefront of progressiveness, but this can be misleading. I mean, one very simple example, um, uh, I come back to is women in the tech sector. Um, you know, if you look at the overall percentage of CEOs, female CEOs in the in the top Fortune 500 companies, it's I think it's around five percent. In the tech sector, it's even less. Um, so here you have a sector that is pushing forward the 21st century, and yet deeply imbibed with 19th century values. Um, there's something wrong there. There's something. Do, do, so let's not imagine that because we're digitally enlightened, we're enlightened in terms of um, what we're doing for humanity uh, and in terms of the values we represent. And often it's unwitting. I mean, nobody decided to exclude women from the tech sector or exclude minorities from the tech sector. But it happened by default. But this is wrong. Default is not a good function to be in. And we need to switch the default function. When it yeah. comes to startup, I think there's, there is some promising signs, but there's still a very long way to go. So my plea is let's be more conscious of what we're doing for society. Let's be more conscious of whether we're um, increasing polarization or reducing it, increasing inequality or reducing it. And I think if we all work better together, we can make serious progress. And to that point, you've, you've mentioned a lot of polarization and disconnect. Um, can you give us some tangible examples of some early actions taken by leaders that um, helping uh, contribute to those, uh, those SDG goals? Well, many, many like um, to, to quote um, the examples of, of both Kenya um, and, and Rwanda, Kenya, where there's been huge um, uh, uh, efforts by government and by the private sector and by aid donors to maximize fintech, to bring people who otherwise wouldn't be able to come into um, the economic um, life or would have much more difficulties to give them access to credit, to give them access um, to markets which they wouldn't have so that, I mean, the Kenya example is often broadly cited. In Rwanda, there's been all sorts of examples of, of better using digital technologies um, to, to help the remotest communities, whether it's using drones for, 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 for the distribution of medicines that otherwise would be much more costly uh, to, get, to get to market. So there are many, exam there are many outstanding examples but are they to scale and are they happening universally? That's really the challenge of our times. Um, not just, you know, always being able to cite often the same examples, but looking at where things are drifting on the whole um, and, uh, 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 and seeing how that, um, uh, how, how we can tip things the other way and bring the outstanding examples that do exist to a scale where they have much greater global impact. 
Um, and I just want to remind um, the viewers that if you have any questions to put it in Slido, um, the hashtag is, or the, um, the code is SDIS. Um, I know that the questions are um, starting to come in, so we'll get to them at, towards the end. Uh, Peter, I want to go back to you, and we've talked a little bit about this throughout uh, some of the great examples, um, but we touched on some of the civil liberties uh, with Rebecca as well. Um, if you look at the media term um, on text role um, with them combating the uh, COVID-19, you've got supercomputers analyzing compounds and drugs, you've got e-commerce companies uh, delivering household goods, medical supplies, video conferencing, allowing us to have this conversation today, enabling education and, and work from home. Um, you've got companies like Apple and Google and others coming together to help with contact tracing. Um, but that also, um, in where, where, how do we hold these tech companies to account so that they're not uh, going against their civil liberties, but also providing the good um, towards towards those goals? I think it's a great question, Sarah. So let me let me. Um, I will come back and ask that directly. If you don't mind, I just want to respond to a couple of uh, I thought brilliant points from the Under Secretary, um, and I will make sure I, I don't um, that I come back to that. Uh, so first of all, I think the the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation. Um, and the fact that it sets out a global, and I think he made this point, a global framework for those of us across sectors, um, but also in particular big tech and players like us who work with, uh, well, in our case, the largest consulting and technology player working with all of those tech companies um, to tackle many of the critical issues at the heart of the SDGs, digital inclusion, trust, security, AI, um, in a way that aligns it with the SDGs, but also aligns it with that critical need for transparency, for security, for trust. I think it's extremely welcome. And I do believe many of the points that he mentioned are very real risks to undermining the full value that digital transformation and our transitions to digital economies um, can deliver. And that is not what I think is at the heart of what tech wants or is in its own self-interest. Right. So that's that's my first point there. I think I will say, um, I think I agree completely with him about the gender issue in tech. I will say I'm extremely proud to work for Accenture, um, where we have the most aggressive goals in the industry, um, to have 25% of our leaders by 2025 and 50-50 overall in the company, and Julie Sweet, who became our CEO last year, um, you know, a female leader. But I do think his point is absolutely right about unconscious bias and also about this sense in which we haven't built this into uh, the way we think strategically across the sectors as an imperative. Right? And so I buy, I buy that story as well. I, I think um, for me, the, the, the point about holding accountable um, ourselves and, and our companies uh, is really uh, at the one point, it's about values and ethics of leaders and making sure that across your culture, that is not simply a, um, a soft wiring or optional approach within organizations, but is hardwired into stage gates in product development, into remuneration and rewards, into uh, recruitment, retention, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that actually we have that, those values very clearly built into everything we do and ask the questions uh, about what impact that's having on a consumer or a citizen, and to the point that was made about privacy or secure, security is non-optional. We must make sure that we're secure. Privacy should be done with active consent. You know, this is not something that we should be making decisions on for people. We should be making them with people. I think the problem that we have is that we have a mixed mismatch between the pervasiveness of global technology and markets and connectivity and national um, regulatory frameworks and uh, the point that well, in many cases tech firms are way out ahead of regulators and they struggle to keep up. So I think global principles are good but we also need to make sure that there is real collaboration between those tech companies, between the ecosystems like ourselves, having active dialogues with governments as the legitimate representatives of citizens and consumers and having a grown up debate and trying to keep them up to speed and being prepared to actually have a much more open, transparent dialogue on what's right and what's wrong. We're never gonna solve this purely with regulatory effort. It will be partly regulatory, but it will have to be industry leading self-regulation and voluntary standards. 
And I think what we need to keep coming back to is the examples that, that that trust enables us to deliver because it enables the adoption of technologies faster. That's good for business. That's good for consumers. Uh, and I'll give you an example. The NHS, we recently rolled out during the COVID crisis, 1.2 million examples of Microsoft Teams so that people could work more securely or the incredible pace of cloud computing totally revolutionizing the footprint of the growing technologies that we see in areas like data centers, or you know, the way in which we see the retail channel and, and online consumption, online consumer technology emerging at pace. All of those rely on trust and consent and having that public dialogue openly. So it's in business's interest. Uh, and as I say, I welcome, I think we welcome uh, having more and more global frameworks and dialogues that, that can set that tone. No, those are great, great and incredible points, Peter. I know we only have a few minutes and I feel like time's flown by. So I'm going to try to get one um, audience question in. Um, Mr. Undersecretary, I'll throw this one to you. Uh, in developing countries, digital literacy and technology capacity of civil society is still low holding back our entire society. How to unleash that potential? I, you know, in the least developed countries, connectivity is is less than 19%, while in the developing countries, for the most part, it's over 18%. So the, the gap between developed and developing, unless we make extremely determined efforts, is only going to get worse. And the SDGs are going to be more invasive than others. And I think technology has thrown that into stark relief. And, and, and made the challenge more acute. In terms of the challenge in developing countries, I mean, what, what's become clear is that it's only partially an, an infrastructure challenge. Connect, you know, connectivity, um, um, it, it, the, the potential for connectivity is six times higher than the actual connectivity in terms of network availability. So the problem is affordability, the problem is scale, skills, the problems is um, public policies and, and regulation, and we have to attack all those. And in many countries, it's about having local language content available. In many countries, it's about boosting literacy rates. Um, so I think we need much more concerted efforts. We have to, we have to, capacity building efforts now are largely supply driven. So companies go in with their product and provide capacity building around their product or countries go within their security approach and do capacity building around their approach to digital security. We need needs assessments that look at policies, that look at digital skills, that look at infrastructure in an integrated objective way and come out on a case-by-case -case basis of where the needs are. And then we build integrated responses around that. Um, and ITU and UNDP are trying to step up efforts to do that. So the UN is trying to equip itself better to do that. But I think we need to look at the problems from an integrated aspect. And we need massive investment in this. You know, there's huge public investment going on now as part of the build back post COVID. Public investment internally, public investment externally. And digital, building back digitally, including with skills training, has to be a large part of that. And the voice of companies, the voice of WEF can be very important in that. That's, that's great. Um, I'm going to throw in actually one more um, audience question, and this one's quite relevant to uh, us at NBC and, and coverage as well. Uh, and Rebecca, I'll send this one to you. Uh, social media is accelerating both good and bad. Tech solutions are overwhelmingly with choice. How soon is a digital and real life balance um, happen for humanity? How soon is a pretty difficult and big question to answer, but I will maybe just build on the undersecretary's excellent points to say that uh, some of the, the training and skills, so to speak, that, that we need to um, arm people with is, you know, how to understand uh, when information is being uh, misused and also how to protect uh, their security. And, and so I think there, you know, we need, we need people to have enough information uh, about how this technology does change things. Uh, and we do see some excellent examples of people um, working at the grassroots level to help uh, audiences understand it. Um, I know we did go a little bit over, so uh, I'm being told we need to wrap up. Um, thank you everybody for joining this panel. It was a great discussion. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for joining me. Um, for everyone else, uh, please check out TopLink um, for any other sessions today. There's some great ones scheduled and the hashtag is SDI20. Thank you everybody.
Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.